Thank you very much, Liliana. Yeah, I, what I want to do to tr is to try to talk a bit about how, how we can integrate agriculture better into the sort of climate change debate and climate change policies. I, I think the evidence to date is that it, is, it hasn't been in, put in as intrinsically in, into the process and into the debates as it should be. So briefly, I'm just going to talk uh, on climate change and variability impacts on agriculture and the poor. I'm going, to talk, I'm going to describe some of the issues related to adaptation strategies in the agricultural and rural sectors, and then discuss the potential for pro-poor mitigation as, as an opportunity for generating new, new uh, uh, value streams in the agricultural sector. And finally, talk a, little, a few conclusions about how we might go forward to better include agriculture in the, uh, in the climate change process. But there's a growing consensus uh, on sort of the broad outlines of the impacts of, of climate change on agriculture and on the developing world in particular. And you know, as we all know, uh, rich countries emit the majority of uh, greenhouse gases. Now with China's growth, it's probably about 50-50, but in terms of per capita terms, of course, the, the OECD countries are far uh, greater uh, producers of greenhouse gases in the developing world. Uh, but on the flip side, at, at the same time, poor countries are much more vulnerable uh, in general to the, to the impacts of, of climate change that are on the way uh, and that we're probably seeing some of already. Uh, this is due to a number of factors, including the geography, that uh, developing countries, and the tropical countries in particular, are hotter. They either have less rain or are extremely variable rain uh, in many cases, or in some cases, lots of rain that, that could be uh, exacerbated by uh, climate change. They have greater dependence on agriculture and natural resources, which in turn are the sectors which uh, will have very large, uh, bear some of the very large variations and impacts of climate change. Uh, the infrastructure is relatively limited in most of the developing world uh, compared to the developed world, and they rely on low input agriculture. Those factors also make it uh, less easy to adapt and makes them more vulnerable. That's combined with more generally the economic uh, realities of lower income and greater poverty and malnutrition, uh, which also uh, uh, result in lower adaptive capacity, uh, uh, which are, is also worse in many cases by the fact that the, the complementary services is health and education that could be, provide some level of uh, protection uh, is, are also relatively lacking. But one interesting thing, though, is that even though those sort of general conclusions are, are fairly well uh, are fairly well agreed upon, the the total the actual impact on agriculture from long-term climate change uh, is still up to quite a bit of debate. That the, the analyses I think that have been done have not been conclusive so far. I'm going to show this the, the uh, slide here is from a recent study by Klein, which was published in 2007. Which probably actually is probably one of the more extreme uh, estimates that I've seen of the, of the impact of, of climate change on uh, on uh, agriculture production. And sorry, this is out to 2050, which I didn't notice. As you can see here, it does show the fairly large concentration of the negative impacts, of sort of the browns, reds, uh, uh, and, and yellows in Africa and in, in, in South Asia uh, over here, but also with some fairly negative impacts in South America and parts of. of uh, North America as well. We're also now uh, doing uh, uh, s some work on trying to look at uh, more detailed and more highly disaggregated impacts of climate change uh, on agriculture on a crop by cross crop basis, again within the context of the, uh, the free impact model. And a couple of things that we're doing that weren't done by Klein and, and haven't been done fully, I think, by the other studies of agriculture is that we're, 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 having, we're explicitly incorporating hydrological effects through downscaling of the, of the hydrological outcomes of, of uh, GCM models down to the level of, of agriculture production, look at the impacts on yield. And we're also, we have embedded in it uh, endogenous uh, price determination so that we can look at the secondary effects of prices uh, after the initial biophysical shock, which is looked at people like, like Klein. And a, a few things that we're, we're finding, for example, this is for wheat, uh, you, you can see the real, again, we are agreeing that one of the really negative areas is going to be in South Asia. Uh, as you see, India is going to be hit very hard with a reduction in, in wheat yields of more than 10% we project uh, in 2050 compared to a baseline. 
But one thing we find is that the comparative effect, biophysical effect, has a lot to do with outcomes too. So if, because India has such a negative impact, that tends to boost uh, wheat prices somewhat and actually generate some secondary effects to increase uh, crop yields in, in parts of China, which otherwise, from the biophysical effect alone, would have about a zero negative effect. So that it does make a significant difference when you incorporate the economic and international trade effects in, in the estimations. Uh, I think this is a slide that I think is, is, is quite important. This is from the, this, the same analysis of looking at uh, a baseline scenario that includes climate change. It's uh, uh, the stress B2 scenario, which is sort of a moderate change scenario. And that's the, the top line, which shows, as, as you can see, that we're project, we are projecting that we are going to stay in a world of higher real prices uh, compared to uh, in the past uh, with climate change. Then if, if you look at the, uh, at, at the blue line, uh, which is the one that tails off at the bottom, that's the projected price uh, under a, a zero climate change uh, uh, scenario. So the difference between those lines shows uh, uh, this very significant effect on world food prices that we expect climate change to have in the future. And that uh, you see in the early stages out there, say 2015 or 2020, there's not that much difference between those lines. But if, as climate change gathers momentum, you see a very large uh, growing impact of climate change on food prices. And that's one of the key reasons that we find that we're not going back to the sort of long-term declining trend in, in world prices. So, there's very significant impacts, we think, on the agriculture sector coming up. What does that mean then in terms of uh, adaptation strategies? I think one of the almost uh, frightening uh, results I found from the most recent IPCC report is, is their conclusion on adaptation where they say, well, many adaptations can be implemented at low cost, but there's really no comprehensive estimates of adaptation costs and benefits on any kind of disaggregated basis, disaggregated either by types of investment or, or, or by uh, where they should be done. And I think after the work that's been done to date, that's uh, not a very good level. Uh, the types of adaptation uh, that you can see, uh, just very briefly, are you know, either so-called autonomous or spontaneous adaptations, which are the reactive responses uh, to climate stimuli uh, without direct intervention of, uh, from governments, for example, uh, undertaken typically by farmers or other private actors. Uh, triggered by market changes. The, the alternative is policy-driven or planned adaptation, which is a more proactive response to anticipated changes and, and is the result of deliberate policy decisions. Just some, a few very brief examples of those, uh, uh, the autonomous, and you can also divide it into short run and long run. Uh, the autonomous ones include such things as crop choice, crop area, planning dates, and privately offered risk pooling insurance, where it's policy-driven in the short run could be improved forecasting, climate risk research, or government-supported risk pooling insurance. In the long run, on the autonomous side, you get into uh, more long-term investment in on-farm irrigation, private crop research, for example, uh, by sort of private companies, and the analogous ones in, in the uh, policy-driven ones would be large-scale public goods investments, such as water storage and roads, or public uh, crop research on things like drought tolerance and, and heat tolerance. And some of the issues, a lot of issues are raised up, for example, an autonomous one, uh, uh, one of the key issues arise if you rely only on autonomous uh, uh, or reactive adaptation, what is the ability of the poor to, uh, and capacity of the poor to adapt, or are they going to be losers uh, in this process, and what kinds of social safety nets uh, could help uh, alleviate some of the uh, distributional consequences, and what are the trade-offs with mitigation, which I'll talk about in a moment. And policy driven, one of the really, one big problems really is the uncertain returns to public investments under the, given the uncertainty uh, uh, in climate change and how do you target that. For example, you could hypothesize in general that with climate change there could be a need to have greater investment in large scale dams in some areas to have greater storage capability. But on the other hand, if you don't have a, a rigorous enough assessment of what's going to happen to hydrology and rainfall and, and stream flow, where are you going to put that dam? Or would you, in fact, be better off not going large scale and, and investing a lot of small small structures as well? And, and to move the debate beyond that's going to need more research. I think there's a general consensus and that I guess I would agree with that much of the adaptation process that we have to deal with is, is sort of an extension of, of good development policy that we would do uh, 
Uh, anyway, again, with uh, promoting growth and diversification, investing in research and development, education, health, moving towards uh, oh, creating more markets and, and, and market-based approaches to allocating water or, and, and payments for environmental services, improving the international trade system to make it more, more flexible than we've seen lately, enhancing resilience to disasters, and promoting risk sharing uh, and, and social safeness. I think that's fine, but I think we, have to, we can't stop there because if we stop there, I think we're, uh, again, leaving agriculture out of the, uh, out of the climate change process. That to, to go, we have to go beyond that sort of, that field. yes, let's get the development policy right, but then we also have to move, over, uh, move on to much more targeted adaptation within a formal policy context and, and development framework. Uh, in particular, uh, we have to be able to explicitly target uh, where the impacts of climate change are, are, are going to be in the future uh, and, and where the effects are going to be highest on the poor and, and from that uh, be, uh, try to start uh, a much more rigorous targeting of adaptation policies to where it has the biggest bang for the buck and, and, and for curing poverty. So market signals are great, uh, so, it, so, so reactive uh, autonomous adaptation is good. It's going to be an essential, essential factor in determining responses, but I think we also have, have to recognize that, that, that market signals oftentimes involve expensive time lags in terms of the, uh, generating the signals that you need in response to climate change. It also does tend to overlook some of the equity aspects of, of, of targeting those who are left behind uh, uh, from market processes. So again, I argue that climate change adaptation must be much more proactive rather than reactive as it has been so far. I think the other side of the story is, is, on, is the mitigation story. And here, um, I'd like to, to make a few points about how I think the mitigation could end up being part of a, a, a solution in terms of uh, developing country agriculture. And one of the key, th the key steps in the, it, it is, is the ongoing process uh, uh, says the post Mali process or Copenhagen process or UNFCC process, it goes by various names, but to develop what would be the post Kyoto International Claim Climate Change uh, Architecture. These are debating a large number of very specific issues uh, on you know, what would be uh, uh, emissions targets, rates of convergence over time across countries, uh, rates of, uh, allowable rates of uh, growth in developing country emissions, and a number of other very important issues. And very fundamentally, the, uh, the last two there, the transparency and complexity of administration of, 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 of mitigation policy and financing of adaptation, adaptation and mitigation, uh, which I'll, I'll talk just a bit more about in a couple more slides. But all of these are going to be crucial, really, in, in, in terms of not just agriculture, but long-term economic growth in, a, uh, in developing countries. Just a quick reminder, this, this, this slide here shows the uh, sources of uh, greenhouse gas emissions by developed countries in the, in the yellow, developing in green, and by sector, including energy, deforestation, agriculture, including land use change, industrial processes, and then waste. And I think it's important to, to notice that, in fact, uh, developing countries do generate a significant amount of greenhouse gas emissions, and, uh, and they're really completely uh, dominant in the deforest, deforestation, greenhouse gas, gas emissions, and have a predominant role also in agriculture. Overall, accounting between deforestation and agriculture account for almost a third of greenhouse gas emissions. So agriculture really is a significant sector uh, for greenhouse gas emissions. Um, given that, given the importance of those in greenhouse gas emissions, policies that could be put in place that would allow those emissions to be, to be uh, part, of, part of the carbon trading or carbon offset process for example, in a new post-Kyoto uh, clean development mechanism, could generate significant income for small farmers and, and investment flows from rural communities. But it, that would require a lot, a number of steps uh, to effectively integrate agriculture into the uh, in, into uh, mitigation policies, including uh, first the improvements of the global governance and, and specific changes that have to be made, but also very importantly in sectoral and micro-level design of the way. Uh, carbon trading markets and contracts are, are put together, and we need uh, significant investment in communities as well. Just a very, uh, another quick way of looking at that slide on, on greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, 
this shows the uh, estimated potential emission savings and cost by sector uh, by, in, by 2050 on an annual basis. As you can see, the first four categories are, or five, including bioenergy, at a, to the, the potential for about 10 to 13 gigatons or 10 to 13 billion tons of CO2 savings uh, per year from, ag from agriculture, most of which, as I, I showed earlier, would be from the developing countries. And it shows also that the, the cost of generating these in terms of dollars per ton of, of CO2 equivalent over a 25 year period on an annual basis are quite competitive with the uh, fossil fuel related uh, costs uh, that are shown at the bottom. So that if, you, if carbon goes up to 20 to 25 dollars per ton, which is a fairly conservative estimate of what would happen if we get serious about climate change, the agricultural sector mitigation and forestry sector come come strongly into play. So that said, okay, that looks great, there's some potential, but then why is it that only, currently only 3%, 3 or 4% of carbon trading is sourced from agriculture, land use, land use change, agroforestry, and forestry. So all those sectors account for only 3 or 4% currently. And, and another telling story is that only 3% of carbon trading is sourced from Africa. So right now carbon trading is basically on industrial and energy sector in, in countries like China, doing things like uh, part cleaning up dirty coal uh, production. But what, why, why is it that agriculture hasn't come into play and what could be done about it? Uh, the first key reason is that the very high transaction costs of, of, of CDM conditions for offset projects currently. Uh, there's a number of important uh, uh, conditions for projects that, that should be maintained. Such that, you, know, you have to prove that, that your savings really are additional. You have to be able to measure it to verify it show the permanence or uh, and leakage prevention. So those are important, but are there ways to reduce the costs? And I'll, uh, the other is, is the need to generate greater information about carbon benefits. The, the, whole, the whole idea of creating markets and putting together buyers and sellers uh, through brokerage processes is, is very difficult, uh, leading to high transaction costs per unit of emission reductions when you have projects in agriculture which has many small holders or, or many small forest communities. Secondly, and even more straightforward, and carbon sequestration from soil carbon and from avoided deforestation is currently excluded from CDM. And, and, and there's considerable ferment in the, in the current negotiations to bring avoided deforestation into the equation, but so far soil carbon seems to still be sort of the, the orphan off to the side, it, uh, even though it could generate four or five uh, billion tons of, of savings uh, uh, of carbon per year. And for example, the same is true in, in the European Union uh, ETS, where uh, again, the deforestation and reforestation are not included. What could be done about that? Uh, first of all, uh, there has to be a lot of institutional innovations, making uh, small farmers and communities to global markets. A uh, number of possibilities would be uh, regional, regional centers that would service a given area, provide the specialized business services and local intermediaries, working with communities. A very important one, and there's some pioneering work done in, for example, in the Chicago Climate Exchange, to make simplified standards uh, for, for measurement of baseline emissions and monitoring for small-scale projects, which, uh, for example, you have standardized amounts per ton uh, of carbon saved for a given intervention in a given agroclimatic zone. Which, which makes it easier than going in and doing very detailed analyses in each and every intervention. Uh, an another issue would be to allow shorter term contracts in, uh, or that, rather than permanent ones and, and have dis discounted rates. So there's a number of, uh, of, uh, of, of possible reforms that to me look practical to bring agriculture in. So where do we go from here? Just to, uh, briefly, I think one is that there really has to be a, a, a more work done to improve the knowledge base for, for bringing agriculture into, into climate change policy. Uh, one is that I emphasized earlier, there has to be better understanding of spatially disaggregated impact of, of climate change, of agriculture and water resources, which looks more and more as a fundamental transmission effect on, on agriculture. Uh, we need to have, continue to work harder to include international trade and economic effects in climate change impact analysis to get a uh, a more realistic assessment of what's going to happen where, uh, and to use those analyses for the spatial targeting of types of adaptation and the cost of be and benefits of adaptation uh, to get at uh, appropriate investments. Uh, yeah, that's a little bit of uh, repeat there. 
In terms of uh, mitigation, again, I, I think most people think I'm probably way too optimistic or hopeful of what could be done on the mitigation side, but uh, there really are potentially very large flows of, of funding uh, if agriculture can be brought, brought to the table here. I mean, if you compare, for example, annual ODA now is about $100 billion, foreign direct investment by private companies is about $150 billion. Uh, estimates of investment requirements for adaptation to climate risk run $48 billion and a little bit upward from there. But, it, but if you can generate, uh, you know, say 13 billion uh, tons of CO2 savings per year from agriculture and forestry, at $20 per ton, you're talking about uh, value streams of 150 to 250 billion dollars uh, per year there. So they're on a par with ODA plus foreign direct investment. But obviously, that you know a lot has to be done, as I as, as I said, from international the international architecture through to micro level reform of contracts. But again, I think that the potential is there that uh, to bring agriculture much more effectively into the uh, climate change processes. Uh, some of the ways to do that, again, create the new value added. It, it also has the effect of increasing profitability of environmentally sustainable practices. I think there's a lot of potential also to employ advanced uh, information communications technology to streamline the measurement and enforcement of, of offsets, financial flows, and carbon credits, and, to, and, and through that to enhance global uh, financial facilities and governance uh, to improve management uh, and funding for both mitigation and adaptation. Thank you.